everybody. It's Dr. Jill, and I'm here live to answer your uh, questions and um, all that we can get to. I have some from a previous session that I'm going to pull up as well. Um, let me just get to that screen. And I look forward to hearing from you tonight. I'm going to get it set up so that I can see the feed beside my video here so that I can see you guys having any questions. And if you haven't checked out my YouTube channel, I hope you will go there and subscribe. It's just uh, under Jill Carnahan on YouTube. And um, you can get all the videos that I've done in the past. I think there's like 43 or four of them now. So looking forward to seeing you there. And um, you can visit my website, jillcarnahan.com um, for lots of free information. We put out a weekly blog, it's all free. And if you haven't signed up for my newsletter, I hope you will do that as well. I send out a weekly newsletter with free recipes, videos that I've done, just all kinds of great stuff. And if there's some products that I've been using in my clinical practice, I'll often share those there. Um, so we'd love for you to sign up for that as well. Um, you can find that on my website, jillcarnahan.com. And if you are interested in products or skincare, we've got some really amazing things, including a new NAD cream, excuse me, um, that my colleague, uh, Dr. Rusk and I recently developed. So NAD is a precursor of ATP and it's one of the um, hottest items now for IVs and everything. Well, we have been experimenting for the last year. You can see my skin, it's in pretty good shape. I've been using this NAD cream and I have not found anything else that's been so profoundly powerful um, for the skin and for regeneration, for collagen, for healing. I used to have acne after the mold and this has been phenomenal for skin, especially if you're prone to acne. We have the NAD cream and then we also have the serum. And the serum's a little lighter. So if you are more um, wanting something that's not so heavy, like in the morning under your makeup, that's a great option. Um, and if you want, the cream is super moisturizing. If you have dry skin, if you live in Colorado, like I do, um, that is a great um, one to use at night. And you can actually use both of them. They're different formulas. They have not only um, the um, NAD ingredient, that's our secret ingredient, but they also have peptides and growth factors. and it's really amazing. And what we tried to do is make sure that it was super non-toxic so that it's a very clean formula that you can count on. Um, I know I've seen some of the pharmacies will compound the NAD cream and that's what I first started to use, but it had aluminum in it. And I was like, holy cow, um, aluminum is not gonna be good if I put that on my skin every day. So we developed this NAD cream and serum without aluminum. Now, I just have to tell you, I had no plans to talk about the NAD cream coming on here, but as I'm getting ready, I wanted to just fill the time and share some of the fun things I've been working on. So I um, thought I would share that with you. Uh, so welcome, hi, Lauren. Um, great to have you on and everybody else watching. Like I said, just please comment in the box here. I'm gonna pull that up um, in just a second so that I can see your questions on the side. Um, let's do this and then I will go to the Q&A page. I have another set of questions that you had all um, put in a few weeks ago when we put posted on Instagram that I was gonna do a Q&A. And my plan is now to actually um, do this probably once a month. So if you if you uh, subscribe to my Facebook page, you can see when we'll be doing these. We'll probably put them on Instagram as well. And if you don't follow me on Instagram, it's just drjillcarnahan.com. We put lots of videos there as well. So all these places, it's all just free content. I love to educate you and share what I'm learning. Um, and so this is just another way that I can do that. So let's first go to um, the document that I had for questions. Um, so it looks like that's missing. So I'm just gonna go live with your questions right now. Um, so hi, Pam, hi, Jenny, hi, Ann Warren. Um, thank you guys for joining me tonight. So just feel free to put in the comments your questions and I'm gonna start going through them. And I'm sure we won't run out of content. I'll be here for at least 30, 45 minutes, as long as we can get through some of these questions. So um, Pam just says, hi. Um, Jenny says, 30, 24 to 36 hour fast makes me feel horrible. Why? So this is interesting because if you caught, um, I did a really technical Facebook Live earlier today with Dr. Richie Shoemaker, and we were talking about 
proteogenomic testing, some of the new transcriptomics testing. Basically what this does is it allows us to check for gene expression um, in test and really cutting edge stuff that they're doing there. Um, but one of the things that came up in that discussion was the fact that when people are exposed to mold or biotoxins, a lot of times they're hypometabolic. What that means is the mitochondria and the production of um, RNA and DNA and even insulin resistance, a lot of this stuff is affected by mold. So for example, what I see really common in clinical practice is someone gets a mold exposure and they gain 20, 30 pounds. They have a pretty significant weight gain and they actually start to have their labs look as if they have diabetes. Um, so, and some people will have full blown. Now you guys know, sometimes I share my personal stories. I have something that I haven't shared super widely publicly, but, um, when I had mold exposure in 2015, um, I would, got very, very sick. And, um, part of that illness, my A1C went up to 6.0, which is on the border of diabetes. And I developed auto antibodies, auto, um, GAD antibodies. And I actually saw an endocrinologist and she diagnosed me with type one, um, latent onset adult diabetes. So I was actually clinically diagnosed with type one diabetes, which is the adult onset form, which means I didn't have it from childbirth, but also which means my pancreas was kind of conking out. It was like an autoimmune version of that. Now, some of the patients that I see with mold exposure, um, they will have a, actually like a type two diabetes developed just from insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. And again, the mold does this and I'm getting to the answer to your question, I promise. Uh, but I think this is relevant. So um, what happened is first of all, I didn't tell a lot of people because I wanted to see if I could reverse it. And by decreasing the toxicity of mold, and then using a variety of, um, you know, some of the peptides, nutrients, detox support, sauna, PEMF, all these things we talk about um, with mold detox, I have a completely normal A1C and a normal anti-GAD autoantibody. And I do no longer have type one latent onset adult diabetes. And in the literature, this is considered irreversible. So this is a pretty big deal. Maybe someday I'll be able to write up my case and what I did to reverse that. But I actually have totally normal fasting blood sugars and totally normal A1C now. And that's just um, pretty amazing what the body's capable of. So back to your original question, Jenny, about fasting. So if you are prone to having a difficulty with insulin receptors and getting the sugar inside the cells and the um, and, and metabolism, basically, when you fast and you can't use ketones because you're diabetic, pre-diabetic, or have metabolic issues, um, you actually feel worse because you have no available source of um, sugar or fuel and you can't use those ketones properly. So there are people um, that do not do well on the fasting. And I would look at toxic load and decreasing toxic load because if you address that, um, sometimes you can improve it so that you could do ketosis. And all that to say, I did this interview earlier with Dr. Richie Schumacher and we were talking about that, how some people in the midst of biotoxin illness do very poorly on ketogenic diet because they are not able to utilize those ketones. Now, in the appropriate situation, I love ketogenic diets. Uh, I use them, prescribe them. I'm not against them at all. Um, but for the person who has trouble with the glucose metabolism, um, you're not going to feel well. So that was a long answer, Jenny, to your question. Hi, Nikki. Oh my gosh. It's great to see you here. Please, please throw in some questions if you want. Um, Je Jennifer, it's great to see you here too. What PMF mat do you recommend? Well, my colleague, um, Dr. Shalise Pratt turned me on to PMF a while back and she has this amazing like $20,000 NASA version. And so back in the day, I was like, oh, that's a lot of money to invest on a mat. Um, the ones I, the one I use now, and I'm going to try to show you down on the floor there. I don't know if you can see it has a blanket on top. It says kindness matters. Um, that mat is from higher dose. And um, I love this mat. This mat is, is under a thousand dollars, which is really relatively inexpensive for PMF. I use it every day, at least 20 minutes, sometimes twice a day. Um, if you go to my blog, I'll be sure and put this in the links. I wrote a blog about PMF just to tell you what it does and all of that. I'm going to try to find the link real quick right now. Um, and I talk all about kind of the benefits of PEMF. And I'll tell you personally, I have seen so much change in my own health by using the mat. Within 10 days of using that PEMF mat, some labs of mine that had not normalized in many years started to normalize. So granted, there was, there's always other variables, but I really believe, in fact, I believe so much in the PEMF mat that I bought them for all of my siblings for Christmas and my staff. So I wouldn't do them to all experience this. 
So I'm a huge fan. You'll hear me talk about it. Higher Dose is the brand. And what I like about them is it's a reasonable, it's an affordable um, mat and um, it really works. And when I, again, talk to some of my colleagues who use these and use the real expensive mats, their take on it was PMF technology is not really that expensive. It's all the bells and whistles. So they felt like potentially these lesser expensive mats um, would get a good result. And that's what I've seen. So the higher dose is what I recommend just because it's affordable for the average person. Um, and there's a setting on there for ions. So you have the crystals, the amethyst crystals in the mat, and it creates a negative ion setting, which is like the earth's surface. So really good, like a grounding practice, almost like if you're walking barefoot on the beach. Um, and then it also has a heat infrared heat setting. So it's kind of got like three in one, the infrared heat, the ionic setting, and then the PMF settings. And I'm, I just can't say enough good about it because I feel so good um, since I've been using that. I think it was about a month or two ago that I started. Um, if you do want the mat, you can get a discount by using the code um, Jill75 on the Higher Dose website. So just feel free to use that. Um, I think it's there's no expiration date on that if you are interested. Okay, what else do we have here? This is so fun to see so many of you, which I know well. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, Anne, hi, Anne. Um, do you care any makeup that doesn't react to the eyes? Um, this is a great question because a lot of people have the sensitivity over the eyes. Um, I found uh, Bare uh, Minerals and Tarte to be kind of commercially available lines that Tarte uses a lot of Amazon clay. And again, it might be just a marketing ploy, but I've found it to be fairly clean and I don't react to that brand. And you can find it at Sephora and, and most of the um, kinds of places that we buy, you know, a regular old makeup. Um, Jane Ireland has a line that you can get and super clean. So for those who are the most sensitive, I'm a huge fan of the um, Jane Ireland uh, lip lip gloss. Sorry, I think I have some of my teeth. <laughs> um, a lip balm and lip gloss and some of their um, eyeshadows are they're really clean as well. Maybe some of you who are in listening today might have some other suggestions. Um, when I get set with makeup, I kind of use the same thing and I use a lot of Tarte and Bare Minerals and Jane Ireland. Those are my main go-tos and they're, I don't tend to react to those. That's a great question. You know, there's another great resource. Um, Skin Deep is a research from the Environmental Working Group. So ewg.org has resources. And this one is all about skincare and makeup. And you can look up the rating there and some of the ingredients to see if there's any toxicity associated with it, like cancer-causing ingredients. So I use that all the time. It's a database to look up cosmetics and things that we put on our body, because really, honestly, that um, is so critical to our overall health. Um, many of you already know this, but at 25, I got breast cancer. And I remember um, trying to understand this, like why in the world did I get breast cancer at 25? And uh, I grew up on a farm in Illinois where there was lots of chemicals that had endocrine disrupting effects being used, including atrazine, which is banned in the in European nations, but not here. And when I looked on the map to see um, uh, the use of atrazine, I remember looking at Illinois in central Illinois where I grew up was the darkest, reddest, most um, prevalent use of atrazine um, in the US in the year that I was born and all the way through till I was diagnosed with cancer. And it's a known endocrine disruptor, which means it messes with our hormones and breast cancer is a hormonal cancer. So uh, again, I'm not saying the atrazine caused my cancer, but I think the chemicals I grew up with um, were part of the uh, picture. All that to say, after I got cancer, I realized that my uh, lotions, my shampoos, my conditioners, my bath and body products, these were all really, really important in um, detoxifying. So I literally went through all of my stuff, cleaning products, and made sure that I used very clean, non-chemical, non-paraben, um, non-toxic, non-phthalate containing um, things in my bath and beauty regimen, because I knew that that was contributing to toxic load. And sadly, our young girls, uh, you know, if they're using lots of bath and body products and some of the most popular things that are in the mall are just junk and they have, you know, um, lauryl sulfates in them. SLS is a common one. Anything that says paraben at the end, phthalates and perfumes especially are real common to contain these. So I've chosen to use just our essential oils for the most part, or some sorts of perfumes that don't have the phthalates and parabens. If you do love your favorite designer perfume, I would recommend you spray it on your clothing and not your skin. And Robbie's trying to pop up to say hi here. So he just got a bath. We'll let him say hi, and then I'll put him down. <laughs> um, so 
Okay, so thank you, Anne. Uh, Jenny mentioned last A1C 5.6. So uh, ideally with your A1C, you want it below 5.5 and lower is better um, in general. Now you can get too low if you tend to have a lot of hypoglycemic episodes, you could be below four or 3.5, something really low. That can be an issue too. But generally I like to see it um, below 5.5. Um, when you start to get above 5.5, you're in that pre-diabetic range and um, blood sugar is such a predictor of mortality of illness. So it's really important. Fasting blood sugar, I like to see below 90. And again, as I mentioned in my story here, um, when I had the mold exposure, I was running 97, 102. I was running much higher. Now I generally run 75 or 68 or you know 82, pretty low um, fasting blood sugars. Eliana, hello. Um, can I have systemic candida if I have 18 months of continuous, yes, daily antibiotics to treat mycobacterium in the lungs? What do you recommend? So um, sadly, fungal infections are more and more common because um, yeast is a result of a weakened immune system and they're opportunistic. What that means is they will take advantage of a weakened system. So when our system is under siege by stress, lack of sleep, antibiotic use, um, pregnancy, um, other things, uh, diabetes, which creates higher blood sugars. All of these things contribute to a predisposition towards having issues with fungal um, infections like candida. Although there's other ones like rhodoturlia and other species of candida that can be there besides just the um, candida albicans, which is the most common. So Eliane is asking what to do. Um, if you have been on frequent antibiotics or on long-term antibiotics, you definitely want to think about this as part of the issue. Um, if you're testing, what I usually do is I do serum candida antibodies, um, which can tell you if you've had an immune reaction to the candida and, candida and thus an exposure. Um, the other thing we can do is a stool test, but if you don't have candida in the um, colon, you typically won't show up on the stool. So you may have lots of candida in your sinuses or in your upper gut, like the small bowel, and the stool test will be negative. So then you think you don't have it, but there's a real issue. What I've found to be the most helpful to diagnose is organic acids, which is urine testing you can do, and different companies, Genova Diagnostic, Doctors Data, Great Plains, um, even US Biotech now is doing this, and they will test for different metabolites of the yeast in the urine so that if you have several of those high, then we know that somewhere in the body, usually the gut, you have candida. So Eliana, what I recommend is you can do things like caprylic acid. Um, on my website, drjillhealth.com, we have a candida destroyer. It's one of my favorites because it combines oregano, caprylic, um, and a couple other things. And it's really a nice formula for treating yeast. Um, you can use oregano by itself. You can use undelisaic acid. You can use powder arco. Um, many, many of these things have antifungal activity. If it's serious, I recommend talking to your doctor about nystatin, which is a non-absorbable antifungal that's fairly safe and well-tolerated, or even an azole, which would be fluconazole or uh, iatroconazole or some of those kinds. Those are much stronger and they do if they can go through the liver and affect the liver. So you want to use those under a doctor's supervision. Hi, Patrick. You said, I have a great plane showing okra toxin, mycophenolic acid, and citronin. What do you recommend? Um, also recently diagnosed with episcleritis. Is this connected to the mold exposure? Um, thank you, uh, Patrick, for your question. Um, and I want to get an article that I want to share really quick. So give me one second. Um, and then I want to answer this question. Because... Um, Okay, so back to the question. Um, you were asking about uh, the mycophenolic acid and the ochre toxin and all of those. Um, there is a lot of controversy about urinary mycotoxin testing because some uh, docs will say that it only comes from food. Um, clinically, I have not found that to be my experience unless there is maybe just a little bit of ochre or aflatoxin and there's been exposure to like peanuts or some moldy food of some type. In general, I do find that these to be at least uh, um, something that leads us in that direction to look for mold exposure. So I don't always just stop with the urine mycotoxin test. What I want to do then is say, check your environment, um, look behind your walls, get an inspector, do an ERMI test, do an EMA test. You can do some of these things to actually check and see if there's mold in the environment. But if you have symptoms and you have mycotoxins and you have labs that are abnormal, it's likely that's an issue. And especially Patrick, when you say more than one mold, um, that is kind of a, a, a and uh, usually a sign to me that there probably is a real issue. So what to do? Um, one of the things, because I can't see everybody, um, I would love to, but I did develop that mold, miracle mold detox box. 
And you can find stuff on that at Miracle Mold, um, sorry, molddetoxbox.com. Um, it is a kind of an all-in-one, I call it the happy meal of mold, which is probably a terrible analogy. Um, just because for patients who can't see me or who are, you know, just wanting to get started, what it has in it is kind of the basics for detox. Now you can make these things up yourself. You can go buy glutathione in a binder. You can do that. And that is just fine. The only reason I did this is to help people who maybe can't get in to see a functional doc and need some sort of tool. And of course, um, it depends on who you are, how sensitive you are, how quickly you can take it. It's a 30 day box, which means means like all the stuff you need to take up the detox for 30 days are in there. But a lot of people say, well, is that all I need? And the truth is you almost never will detox mold completely in 30 days. So it's not about use it for 30 days and you're going to be well. Um, in fact, the truth is as you start to detox, Patrick, you might feel worse before you feel better. Um, because as you get these toxins out of your body, there's sometimes collateral uh, damage. You can get hives, you can get histamine issues, you can get reactive, you can not feel well, like foggy thinking or fatigue or brain fog, any of those things, super common. So the key there is you go very slowly if you don't feel well. So whether it's my mold detox box or some other product that you're using to detoxify, um, you want to go very slowly at the rate of which you can tolerate that detoxification. Um, so it's super important because if you overload, I always think of it as there's elimination and excretion, uh, mobile, sorry, mobilization and excretion. So mobilization is getting the toxins out of the tissues. Excretion is getting them out of your body. And everything we do is a, whether it's infrared sauna or Epsom salt baths or alkalinization with mineral water or glutathione or binders, I'm always calculating with my patients, where are they at with mobilization and excretion? Because what happens is as you're mobilizing, if you go too quickly, you get these things out of your tissues and they have nowhere to go. They can't get out through the bowels or through the lymphatics or through the, and your body, every body has a capacity to detox. And when you kind of hit that threshold, you need to back up. So if you're having trouble or not feeling well, usually I say, take a break, back up on dosing, um, increase your things that will help with excretion. And that could be things like Epsom salt baths. It could be mineral water, Alka-Seltzer gold, anything to alkalinize the body. We heard today with Dr. Richie Shoemaker's very technical talk, but it was excellent um, how we talked about metabolic acidosis being at the root of many of these things. And that's why when we alkalinize the patient, they feel better. So things that you can do to alkalinize, you can eat more leafy greens. You can drink mineral water like San Pellegrino, Gerald Steiner between meals. You can take up some salt baths. You can um, take Alka-Seltzer gold. There's all these ways to help alkalinize your body, get minerals in it. Um, and that will usually help as well. So Patrick, hopefully that's a long answer to your question. Um, hi, Anna. Thank you. You said, thank you. Congratulations on reversing your type one. Um, for autoimmune, when should we make our decision regarding the vaccine? Oh boy, <laughs> this is a tough issue. And I think you guys know me well enough to know I'm not a black and white kind of person. I always individualize it to the patient. Um, the truth is we've had about two months of clinical trials on both of the vaccines that are out now. And uh, we don't know for sure if there's any risk of autoimmunity. However, if there is, I do not believe we will see that risk manifest in the two months of preliminary trials. So um, my uh, gut feeling is with someone with severe autoimmunity or inflammation, um, wait and see might be a better approach. But I always talk to the patient individually. I have someone the other day who was very, very worried. And I said, go get it. You know, I'm not, I'm not black and white in this sense. I just feel like um, there probably are going to be more long-term effects in certain people that we won't, would not see in the eight-week preliminary trials. So um, I would just like to watch and wait and see the data um, and make up our mind based on the science. And I'm willing to do that. I just, we don't really know yet. So Nina says PEMF, not PMF. Yes. So PEMF is pulsed electromagnetic frequency. And I think I included a link to the blog article about it. Naomi asked, what about sauna? Yes, Naomi, sauna is a fantastic way. So these are just different therapies. So sauna is more, um, infrared sauna will help your tissues eliminate and excrete toxins through the skin. 
So sauna is a fantastic idea. I use that as part of my protocol a couple of times a week as well. Um, and you can do it for 30 minutes at 130 degrees or up to, you know, 150 degrees for some people up to 45 minutes. It depends on what you tolerate. If you have POTS or postural orthostatic um, tachycardia or any of the um, mast cell issues, you may want to go slowly because that heat can be a trigger for mast cell issues or for hypotension where you feel dizzy or lightheaded. And I usually recommend if you're doing sauna and you're prone to that, electrolytes will help. So you can try that. But yes, I'm a huge fan of sauna and it's, it's different from PEMF. So these are different things. PEMF on a um, really simplistic level, this doesn't do it justice, but I think of it as like plugging your cells into a battery. So it's almost like giving your body the um, energy that it needs to recharge and renew. And there's different hurt settings. So some of them are for more of a calming setting to induce a deep sleep. Some of them are more for healing, healing collagen, healing bones. There's studies with osteoporosis. There's studies with healing uh, ligamental injuries and pain syndromes, studies with brain and cognition. So lots of stuff. If you look up PEMF, in the data, um, you're going to find lots of studies on that. Um, hi, Lauren. I uh, wonder if you can discuss low WBC, low neutrophils, high lymphocytes might indicate. So when I see low neutrophils or low uh, white blood cell on a um, test, um, it could be um, some sort of immune suppressive effect. So like chemotherapeutic drugs can cause that certain drugs that are used to treat rheumatological disorders can cause that. So the first thing is check your drugs, make sure there's nothing that you're taking that's suppressing your white blood count. And then the second thing I look at is if there's some chronic infection the things I might find most common with a low white blood cell count is um, either chronic viral infections or chronic Lyme or co-infections. So it could be like Lyme, Bartonella, Babesia, Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, any of those. And so I might go looking for Lyme disease or co-infections for the chronic low white blood count. Uh, Liana says, uh, would you recommend infrared sauna and PMF mat? Is that too much? No, the problem is cost, right? All these things cost money and you sometimes have to make choices of what to do. So infrared sauna is a really great detox tool. And because of our toxic environment, gosh, we probably all should incorporate that. Um, and you can get anything from those little boxes that you sit in. Um, I have an infrared blanket you can lay in. I have a, a full infrared sauna at the office. Um, so again, it depends on what you can afford, um, but those are great for detoxification and they're really important. PMF is a little bit different. It's more of a tool for healing, for um, cellular regeneration, for brain, for cognition, um, for energizing your body, um, for inducing better sleep. So it's a little bit different in the technology. Um, the mat that I was telling you about does have that infrared setting. So I'm assuming there'd be some detoxification as well. Um, so they would both help detoxification, but the mat is a little bit different use. And like I said, I included my article so you can read more. Um, Shauna, what are your thoughts on the connection between EBV and IC? So IC is interstitial cystitis. Maybe some of you suffer from that. That's that inflammatory condition of the lining of the bladder. Um, the biggest connection I see with IC is histamine. So usually there's some histamine issues, either breakdown of histamine or, or issues with um, mast cells um, that cause irritation to the bladder. And then certain foods can be triggers and other things as well. Um, so that's a little complex because there might be some other infection or toxic thing that's driving the histamine, that's driving the IC. Um, but that's usually one of the underlying um, things. So you ask about Epstein-Barr. Um, I have not seen a direct correlation with the virus causing IC, but I could see the virus or any infection for that matter causing increase in histamine, which could cause um, IC. Oh, Mitzi, Beauty Counter, you're right. I love Beauty Counter and I forgot to mention. Thank you for mentioning that because that's a great clean brand. I know one of my colleagues for Christmas gave me a bunch of Beauty Counter products and I can't wait to try them. So thank you so much for, I knew our listeners would have good ideas here. Um, let's see, Naomi, also breast cancer thriver. Awesome girl, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, I am 20 years uh, this year, 2021, 20 years ago, when I was 25 years old. So I turned 45 this year and I had breast cancer. And so good for you, Naomi. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people. It's such a common thing. I'm sure you all listening have a mother, a sister, an aunt, or even yourself that's had it. So um, kudos to all of you who are survivors and thrivers. 
So you asked, do you monitor your blood sugar daily or how do you recommend um, blood sugar? So I don't anymore, although I used to have a glucometer when I was you know, in the throes of trying to control my diabetes and checking it, I did frequently. And what I would do is I would check it after meals when I was fasting, because I wanted to see what patterns were correlating to you know, fasting overnight or first thing in the morning or after a meal, because that gives you great data in what types of foods will raise your blood sugar or what things don't. For, for example, like rice might raise your blood sugar more than a piece of candy. Uh, and I, that's not a great example because they might be equal, but you might be surprised at that types of things like white potatoes, white rice, as far as how much they raise your blood sugar. Um, but it's individual. Everybody's a little different as far as how they metabolize the sugar and use it. So I find that to be really good feedback in how to eat and how to do all that good stuff. And I told you earlier about my experience and I didn't mention, of course, I eat super clean with no sugar and all of that. But as I've gotten away from that um, diagnosis, um, I'm able to eat a lot more fruit and um, berries and um, even sugar once in a while, once in a great while. And it doesn't affect me like it used to. So Hain says, what do you think about chemical um, produced citric acid, uh, acid from nitric, uh, sorry, I can't say this, uh, chemical produced citric acid E330 from aspergillus niger. So um, mold is used to produce a lot of things. For example, a lot of our B vitamins that are like food-based, if you get a food-based B vitamin, it's probably grown on aspergillus or saccharomyces. So patients who have a reactivity or hypersensitivity to yeast, they probably won't do well with those kinds of vitamins. So I literally look at patients bring me in their vitamins. I look at the label because it will say it on there. So uh, citric acid produced from aspergillus niger could be a trigger for people who are sensitive to aspergillus. Absolutely. Jenny, so I might have to investigate detoxing for molds, right? Yes. <laughs> Great question because sadly it's very, very common. Angie, hello. Uh, suggestions for teenagers with attention focus issues. We try to do little no sugar clean diet, but it's so hard. Oh gosh, yes, this is so hard for teens. And I actually love seeing teens and college kids because you know, as soon as they come in there and their arms are crossed and you can tell they don't wanna be there. Um, but what you wanna do is find what motivates them because they're not gonna be motivated by lower blood sugar or less, but they might be motivated by less acne, but you need to find what is their buy-in because if you can correlate their health issues and the interventions that are needed to something that matters to them, that's where you get the buy-in. And then what you want to do, what I do in clinical practice with teenagers is I try to find something simple that they will agree with me to do for 30 days. And then if they see a result, so say, for example, a teenager has acne and we say, you know, what's the buy-in? Well, I don't want to look bad for school or on Zoom calls nowadays. Um, so then the buy-in would be, I, my skin's clear. So I say, well, if we could get your skin to be clear in 30 days, would you agree to do a few things? And, you know, sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no. Um, but if I can get the buy-in, the agreement, and then I would say the start, the very basic gluten-free diet, uh, number one, dairy and sugar tend to be number two and three with acne and with food sensitivities. So if I can get a buy-in with dairy, gluten, and sugar, that's a hard one. Um, I would try for all three. If I can't, I would try for at least gluten. Um, and if not, I could test food sensitivities and find out the biggest trigger. Um, often with women, young girls, there's um, excessive androgens like in PCOS. So I usually check hormones. You might have thyroid dysfunction. There's a lot of things, nutrient depletions, like too little zinc, too much copper. Um, so lots of different things that can tie into acne. And what I found as well is dysbiosis in the gut. So SIBO or SIFO, uh, overgrowth of bacteria or yeast will also contribute. So I'm always checking the gut. Again, that's deeper, but if you can get them a little buy-in and then they actually see a difference, if you can kind of negotiate for 30 days, that's probably your best bet. Eel, um, what's the safest empiric bet to try to balance bacterial gut dysbiosis? Um, so, and it looks like you're out of the country, so not easy to get testing. So this is great because I love SIBO testing. It's a breath test. I do stool testing and I do organic acids, but you don't have to do that to start treatment if you want, as far as herbal things. Um, berberine tends to be a really good bet. Um, and I often use the Metagenics Candibactin AR and BR together. They were studied against Cyfaxin and they have good efficacy against for SIBO. So you can do that. You can do berberine, you can do garlic, you can do oregano, you can do um, grapefruit seed extract, um, and you can combine these things as well. Uh, but a good antimicrobial for a six to eight weeks herbally will often treat the bacterial dysbiosis. Hi, Karen. Uh, any new treatments on the horizon for um, chronic fatigue syndrome? So 
Gosh, um, interestingly, we were just talking about that earlier today with Dr. Shoemaker about the hypometabolism, which is more like a word that sounds like it would be just metabolically associated like diabetes, but it's actually way deeper than that. It's like your mitochondria aren't really working well. And so everything's affected. You increase more lactic acid in the serum. You get more muscle pain, like fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue. So um, the only thing I've really found is looking at infectious load and toxic burden. You've probably heard me say that before, but usually between the two of those, um, I can find infections or toxic load and start to detoxify and treat the infections and see some improvement. Um, antivirals have shown minimal benefit, not frequently, but there are some people who have CMV or Epstein-Barr, and if they test high, um, sometimes the antivirals, either naturally or um, prescription, can help. But there's not a one-size-fits-all, unfortunately, and uh, there aren't any easy answers. Eliana asked, could I have developed fibromyalgia from antibiotic use? Well, there's a lot of things that go into that. So it's not like the antibiotic causes fibromyalgia, but as we mentioned, metabolic acidosis causes lactic acid in the serum, and then that could in, uh, increase pain in your tissues. Um, so there's lots of uh, reasons for that, but toxicity and infections could be part of it. Um, hi, Anna, again, what's your opinion on pulsing supplements versus taking them every day? So this is really interesting. Not all of you are super intuitive. Um, I'm learning more and more that I have a really strong intuition and I kind of usually know what's good for me. If you do, what I'd recommend, there's sometimes I, I take a lot of supplements every day, um, probably more than most of you. Um, so I always show if patients complain about their supplements, like, well, look how many I take because <laughs> it's probably 40 twice a day. However, having said that, there's days when I have the sense like I don't need those today and I won't take them or won't take certain ones of them. Um, and I do believe depending on your gut and your system and what else is going on, it isn't a bad idea to take breaks. Um, and to get to know, especially like maybe you, I had a patient the other day who stopped some things and they felt a massive difference. I felt worse. So then that was just a good evidence that while wow, these things that I'm taking and spending money on every day, I do feel a lot better. So sometimes you can really differentiate by stopping a few of them or, I um, mean, of course you can work with your doctor. That's what I do all, all day long is create recipes for my patients of what the best thing for them to take is. Um, yes, Jenny, you can watch after um, this will be recorded and it'll be on my YouTube channel. And so you can watch it as much as you want. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for joining us. Um, awesome to have you here, Lauren. Um, hello from Monument. Thank you so much. She says you're an inspiration. I appreciate that. You know, there's no greater thing than um, to inspire you like truly at my heart core. Um, inspiration is probably my main motive and goal. goal. So Lauren, that touches me deeply and I really appreciate it because um, that's what I want to do. That's why I'm here. And especially if anything, if you're sick and you've been, you know, through the ringer and you've had a tough last year, like we all have, um, hoping this year will be better. Um, one of the keys is uh, if I can give you just even a nugget that gives you hope and allows you to keep going and know that there are answers because there are. Sometimes it's a matter of finding your right um, group of supportive friends or family or the right doctor or the right coach or the right tools, um, but you there's always hope. And like I said, I have overcome so many things. I'm like the guinea pig for illness and how to overcome it. So if I can inspire and help you, I love to do that. Rhonda says, a uh, period of time in the healing journey when she was unable to take salt baths. Um, have you heard of this? Yeah. So um, anybody can have reactions to anything at all. And uh, Epsom salts uh, have sulfates. And so if you have trouble processing those, um, that could be an issue. Often as we get more healed and well, we can tolerate more things. And that's what I found. Even with sauna, I used to have to do, you know, five, 10 minutes of sauna. And now I can do 30 minutes, no problem at a high temperature. Um, is it normal that mold can cause low blood pressure, which aggravates uh, or dizziness? Yeah, and excuse me, <coughs> a little water down the wrong tube. Um, so yes, um, mold can cause um, a histamine release. And when that histamine is released, a lot of times you'll have low blood pressure. So Jennifer Lindbergh, what can I do for subclinical graves? Um, excuse me, I'm going to cough really quick. I'm going to put me on mute so you don't have to hear me. Okay, I'm back. All good. <laughs> um, so Jennifer says, what can I do for subclinical Graves disease? I'm currently on a low iodine diet. Jennifer, Graves is a tough one because Graves is when you have um, 
autoimmune or inflammatory reason causing hyperthyroid. And um, the traditional treatment is radiating or giving radioactive iodine to kind of um, suppress that production, basically kill the thyroid gland. Um, I have found L-carnitine can bind three, uh, free T3 and free T4. So high doses of L-carnitine might be able to relieve the symptoms. It doesn't cure you, but if you're having symptoms of hyperthyroid, L-carnitine can be helpful. Uh, Lori, Le Lori Lime, <laughs> love your name. How do you approach um, Lyme and Bart when, so, when incredible food sensitivities, high histamine, only eat four foods? Oh, you poor dear. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, this is tough because when you're in the midst of a chronic infection like Lyme or um, mold exposure, you can become so reactive, so overloaded. You know what I would recommend is looking at limbic retraining or anything to do with limbic um, deactivation. Um, this may sound like just foo-foo <laughs> kinds of things, but it's so critically important because um, our limbic system is connected with trauma. And when I say trauma, I used to think of, oh, uh, abusive childhood or something like that. Not all of us have that kind of thing. We might have some very happy situation. And <clears throat> but what happens is that trauma gets linked to the mold. Excuse me again. Okay, I think we're good. <clears throat> I might need to grab some more water. Okay, well, folks, that's real life. <clears throat> I think I choked on some water and had to go cough, <laughs> but I'm back. Um, so we were talking about um, when you're in the midst of Lyme disease and these chronic infections and you're so reactive. So limbic uh, deactivation or retraining would be a great way to go. Uh, DNRS is a program with Annie Hopper. Dr. Gupta has a great program. And then some other things like heart math, where you're looking at um, cohesiveness of the heart and um, I love biurinal beats, which is a way to have different frequencies in different ears and is a really calming, different breathing practices, um, lots of things you can do to deactivate the limbic system. Okay, let's keep going. I'm going to do maybe another question or two. Um, Stacy, hi, Stacy, having some brain fog, difficulty finding words, memory issues, occasional stutter. Um, I don't have any mold toxicity symptoms, so it could be. What do you suggest? Um, so yes, so, um, and I don't know how old you are, Stacy, but I'm assuming um, just by the looks of it, you may be fairly young. <laughs> and if that's happening and you're under um, 50, you really wanna look at um, Lyme mold infections, toxins. Like I said before, infectious load and toxic burden is often the underlying uh, cause. So it could be an infection, could be a toxic load, but yes, I would actually recommend looking um, at mold as a possibility. You can just get the testing to see. Okay, um, what's the best tea to consume with mold toxicity? Um, black tea has been shown to be a little bit higher risk of having mold contamination. Um, and not all black teas, I'm sure, have mold, but um, some of them. And so I typically recommend uh, green or herbal tea um, for that. Angie asks, my husband, um, almost 50, has low testosterone and been getting pellet injections, also fibromyalgia. Any suggestions? Um, so... This is often how we present with the hormones or the thyroid, but underlying there's these deeper issues. Um, pellets, obviously replacement is good because a man who has normal testosterone is at less risk for diabetes or heart disease or some of these things. So that's perfectly appropriate. But with the fibro in that, I would look at other underlying um, causes I have seen. I know you think I keep talking about Lyme disease, but I've seen a lot of patients present with low testosterone with Lyme disease. So I would at least rule that out, especially if you grew up in Minnesota, Wisconsin, um, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Florida, any place that's endemic, I would check that out as well. Hi, Blake. What's the best way to heal the brain for someone with sears or mold? Um, well, the best way is to start with the detox and uh, start getting the toxic load decreased. And then um, using things like sauna, um, PEMF, um, you know, any of these kind of neuroplasticity techniques is super helpful because you can actually, um, we've seen changes in hippocampal volume when you treat mold, but the toxicity has to be addressed first. 
What can be done for numbness in the hand or tingling, especially sleeping um, with hypothyroid? Well, actually, did you know that carpal tunnel, um, sometimes if you have hypothyroid, it can mimic carpal tunnel, which is that nerve issue with the hands. So the first thing would be treat the thyroid because it might go away, um, but it could be overactive or underactive thyroid that causes that numbness and tingling. Also, if you uh, put your hands like this and you sleep you're uh, taking this uh, carpal tunnel and you're trapping those nerves. So um, if you tend to block or trap those nerves like that while you're sleeping, just that alone can cause issues. So you can get those skateboarder wrist guards from you know Target or, or Walgreens anywhere and wear them um, at night um, to keep your wrist at this angle so that you don't do this. That will often help um, on the issues with the wrist. Uh, Lori Lyme, history of trauma, um, RX that can calm it down. Um, this you'd absolutely want to talk to your doctor about, but there's lots of things that we can use um, to calm. I love L-theanine and GABA. I use them frequently. Um, so those are great things to calm that down. Um, some studies have used clonidine, which is actually a blood pressure me medicine, but blocks the PTSD response. Um, they've used that in, you know, young boys and children and even adults with uh, PTSD. Um, and there's all kinds of other things out there that, um, you know, again, you'd want to talk to your doctor about. Hey, Natalie, awesome. There's so many protein powders. What should I look for to help distinguish good from the bad? Um, so what I look for in protein powders, I'm not a fan of soy. The only studies that have shown soy to be beneficial were with uh, Japanese women with miso and tempo, which is fermented soy. So I'm not opposed to that as a food group, but soy protein powders, not a fan. So if it has soy in it, not a good idea. Whey protein is amazing for increasing immunoglobulins. So if you have sarcopenia or immune issues or your muscle loss, but a lot of our patients are sensitive to whey, which is from cows or dairy usually. Um, so I'm a huge fan of plant protein. Um, and I do have a new plant protein complete. I'll be sure and uh, put a link up there to that. We have a special this month with, if you do order that, you get a free shaker cup and a free 21 day detox guide that I put together for January. So just a side note, thanks for asking that Natalie, cause we do have a great plant protein um, that's super clean. You wanna make sure there's no colors, additives, fillers in that. And like I said, I like the plant protein cause it's very digestible and hypoallergic for those of us who are sensitive to wheat or soy or dairy. Um, hi, Nancy, uh, husband and I both tens, uh, tested for molds, different ones. Um, would there be a chance we're not getting exposed in our home? Um, <clears throat> yes, this is possible, uh, but I often see different people um, in different environments uh, excrete different molds. So it doesn't, uh, that didn't really make sense, uh, different people in the same environment excreting different molds. I do find if it's a common, like say it's in the wall of your bedroom or something, you're probably going to have somewhat similarity crossover on the mycotoxin testing or some of the other tests that you do. But yeah, unfortunately, the mold is so common that people can get workplace, condo, ski condo, home, and have all different exposures. And so then you might have a little different um, things coming up on the test. Rhonda, thanks, Jill. You're an encouragement as I navigate the health journey. Oh, thank you. Thank you for those kind words, Rhonda. I sure appreciate it. Daniel, um, would emulsified D be a reasonable solution for no improvement um, in 25-hydroxy D3 on a blood test? Um, yes, you could try. So sometimes uh, vitamins A, D, K um, are all fat soluble. So if you have malabsorption of fats for some reason, um, you may need to do an emulsified or do it with food or something like that. That's not uncommon. Um, so check your gut for absorption issues. If you can't get the D, you can try emulsified. That might help. Get sunshine. That might help. Um, those are all ways to get vitamin D up. Medical mushrooms. Um, I am not the expert in medical mushrooms. There are people who do, who are, and it's also called plant medicine. <laughs> um, I don't feel like I'm qualified to answer that, but I do feel like there's lots and lots of data coming out about the potential benefits. And I think if we watch that, we're gonna see more and more um, about potential benefits. Um, right now, the mushrooms I do use in clinical practice, cordyceps, mataki, shiitake for immune support, those can be really powerful. Uh, Lauren, I have not heard of MUD mud water and coffee alternative. Um, very cool. No, it sounds delicious as long as it has no um, mold. <laughs> it sounds amazing. <clears throat> 
And then Evelyn mentions pea protein with histamine intolerance. It really depends on the person. I would say I find more patients than um, other, uh, more patients tolerate plant-based proteins um, that could be from quinoa or pea or rice than they do some of the others, but it, it really is individualized. There are some people who love the whey protein and have no issue with it at all. Okay. Good. Well, I think we will wind it up for tonight and uh, sorry about the missing in action for the cough, but I will be back uh, next month. I'm going to try to do this regularly. So thank you so much, everybody who, who joined me. I will have this recorded and uh, you can watch it later as well. Have a great evening.